Our solar system is full of resources. On Saturn and Jupiter, methane in the atmosphere is zapped by lightning into carbon dust, which then falls down through the atmosphere high, into high pressure, such that it turns into diamonds. Platinum, gold, iridium, neodymium, these are really valuable minerals here on Earth, and they are locked into asteroids that just fly by us at high speed. And somewhere out there, is a gorgeous red Tesla Roadster launched into space last February. There is one natural resource I want to focus on today, though. It's found only in one place, right here on our blue planet. This valuable presence currently exists in numbers pushing seven and a half billion. It's too fragile to mine with jackhammers and not well enough understood to exist outside of the dark chamber in which it grows. I'm talking about the human brain. Its folds contain ideas, memories, emotions, and knowledge acquired over its lifetime. The human brain is also at the center of why we have existed quite differently than all other species on Earth. It's also the one natural resource, I believe, that will ultimately save all the rest. So let's talk a little bit about what makes the human brain so special. Our brains help us figure out the world. We can jump into a situation, observe it, and come up with a creative way to reach an objective. My three-year-old daughter, Nora, is a perfect example of this. About a year ago, she had fallen in love with swings and playgrounds, but one thing she couldn't actually do was jump. Now, we had traveled to visit some friends, and their children knew all about jumping, and so they saw this couch as a perfect place to do it. And so Nora watched them lay out pillows right in front of the couch so that they were, there would be a soft landing spot. She watched the others leap up onto the couch and jump off and land like it was no big deal. So Nora followed the others' example. And she jumped, but landed just short of the pillows. Now, she threw her hands in the air with a big smile, yelled, Jump! And then burst into tears as blood started running down her, her chin because she had bitten her lip. Okay. Now, a formal lesson in a classroom wouldn't have prevented this outcome. This was the brain at work. Nora used her natural built-in curiosity about other people to get the idea to jump off the couch. She figured out how to use her muscles and integrate uh, how, what she had seen with what she thought would lead to a good landing. She obviously realized that what she did wasn't quite right, and so she absorbed that knowledge for the next time. Another capability of our brains is the curious capability of managing vast amounts of knowledge. An example of this is my mom. For my entire life, she has used an intricate filing system known as the pile. I have always been able to ask her for something, and so she reaches into the correct pile in the correct location and pulls whatever I asked her to get out without looking. Another example is my grandma. She was all of, always full of stories and random bits of the Yiddish language. While tending to pots stewing on the stove, she would tell me, my cousins, and brothers uh, uh, stories about growing up during the Great Depression, or how my dad and uncles would hit each other with darts. Her tradition of passing knowledge to our generation is one of her most memorable qualities. But these characteristics of observing others, storing and communicating information are useful, but in isolation are not unique. One example is the kia, which is a green mountain parrot in New Zealand that is able to figure out puzzles, use basic tools, and destroy rental cars. The capabilities of humans are easily matched and exceeded by other species. The ostrich is faster than us, the gorilla stronger than us, the blue whale more massive than a factor of at least 1,000. We might be tempted to think that maybe we are the only species that passes information between generations, but this appears to be something that animals do regularly as well. There was a recent story in Science Magazine that shared that sheep and moose pass information about the best migration paths to take socially on each trip. New animals that are in, were introduced to existing populations learned where to go from the rest of the herd, and not from some innate sense 
of direction. As humans, our most distinguishing feature goes beyond cultural exchange. At one point, a human decided that she or he could portray a moment of life's experience on the dusty surface of a cave wall. This captured moment could then be shared with another person, and that other person could learn from that record, connect with it, and have his or her life changed through seeing it. And we still do this today. Whether through paint, calligraphy, movable type, hand-sewn leather books, computer punch cards, magnetic tape, digital photos, flash memory, and the cloud, we, as humans, can pass knowledge, skills, and experience to one another without needing to be in the same space or time. We are the only species that can record our knowledge, transfer skills, and convey experiences to both current and future generations. Notes on Newtonian physics taken in the 18th century still do a pretty good job of capturing what students learn in a physics classroom today. Any of you watching right now could pull up a video on how to take a partially filled water bottle, throw it in the air, and have it land standing up. Even if we don't care about that anymore, we can. It's there if we want it. And written language allows a person today to pick up a book and instantly be connected with the experience of Anne Frank, who's a teenage girl who wrote in a diary after being forced into hiding during the Second World War. We have a variety of media on which to record knowledge, skills, and experience, though the forms we choose changes all the time. My grandpa collected a library of hundreds of cassette recordings of the Cleveland Orchestra that he made from the radio. Today, that collection is gathering dust at my parents' house. And we have the technology today to take that entire shelf, all of those cassettes, and shrink them down into a teeny chip of flash memory. Whatever its form, because we have a record of what other human brains have produced, none of us has to start from scratch to understand why water freezes or how to make a perfect batch of chocolate chip cookies. When we have a question to answer or a problem to solve, we have the entire body of recorded knowledge to help us. And knowledge can live beyond the years of a relatively short human life. And as such, humanity has been able to make continuous technological progress. We can always make a better machine when we can study the details of ones that already exist. Today, with the internet and our devices, we can access much of this knowledge almost instantly and almost anywhere. Our accumulation of knowledge and problem-solving sol skills made it possible to extract a reddish-brown mineral from the earth called bauxite, and then use our knowledge of physics and chemistry to turn that bauxite into aluminum metal to go into everything from cans to mobile phones to aircraft. Our collective knowledge and skills have given us command over our home planet and has made it possible to produce more efficiently and rapidly than any other species. This efficiency and success is the legacy of our existence on our planet. And it may lead us to the end of that existence. A billion people, a billion phones in our pocket, a billion vehicles on the road. We cannot exist or produce on scales like this without leaving a mark. Our success as a species has tremendous power and significance. We have a responsibility not just to ourselves, but our culture, our neighbors in the natural world, and our planet itself. We need to know, operate within, and understand existence across many different scales, from molecules to continents, from nanoseconds to millennia. I happen to think that one of the best tools we have to leverage and develop our collective knowledge, skills, and experience is the school. But I don't believe that we're quite where we need to be in a few respects. I've spent the past 15 years as a high school teacher trying to wrap my brain around the nature of knowledge, skills, and experience. And part of the challenge is that we're all born into a world that existed long before us. There simply isn't time to go all the way back to the start and make our, th make our way through the entire record of human thinking. Many teachers say students always need to go back to the beginning. But I believe this doesn't always lead to better understanding of the nature of humanity. 
Furthermore, exploring the thoughts of others is not necessarily as powerful as having our own experiences. When my dad was teaching me to drive in heavy snow for the first time, he asked me to accelerate up to about 10 miles an hour and slam on the brakes. And that forced the car into an icy skid. My, the feeling of the steering wheel in my hands and the car no longer going in a predictable straight line, these were things that my dad wanted me to understand by feel. I was a 16-year-old boy. He wisely knew that it was pretty likely I was not going to listen to anything he said. But experience, he knew, was the best way to teach me what to do if I ever had to slam on the brakes in a real snow emergency. And this is the mark of a great teacher. Great teachers balance the value of having your own experience with the vast amounts of recorded, vast amount, amounts of recorded knowledge <clears throat> that exist. Every teacher you have ever had has struggled with this balance, I promise you. It is unlikely that any one of us would spontaneously derive the quadratic formula. But repetitively applying the quadratic formula without any awareness of what it does or why it's important is the other extreme. When John Dewey first shared his philosophy of schools in 1902, he acknowledged the need for this balance. And we haven't, haven't gotten it completely right over 100 years. And we've seen theories of education swing back and forth. And schools have often been slow to respond to new ideas. Answering difficult questions and solving problems doesn't often divide itself into separate subjects and separate boxes of knowledge, skills, and experience. Why then is the time we spend in school still organized that way? It takes courage for adults in the system to stretch beyond this tradition. And as students, this results in a change to the game that many of you have learned to play very well. I happen to believe that some of the richest learning experiences come from spending our time in the messy space of solving problems that either have no easy answer or that have many correct ones. For me, one experience that does this in an exciting, engaging, and enriching way is building robots. Every year of my teaching career, I've helped students learn to build, program, and iterate their designs. These students learn quickly, and they learn from each other. And when students see that a motor isn't strong enough or can't figure out why a line of code isn't working to turn that motor on, that's when they can call on recorded knowledge, call something up on the internet, and get answers. This creative exercise is full of opportunities to gain knowledge and skills. And there are lots of experiences that fit into this category. I've seen students draw their own manga, build composting systems for their communities, and write code that makes doing their homework much easier. Regardless of the specifics, students need these experiences. And the time to start having these experiences isn't after you've proven you can multiply two-digit numbers or write a five-paragraph essay. We can't wait to have students first do this after they graduate or after they go to university or after they get some work experience. They need to start this today. These headlines are from the New York Times this week. There's an urgency behind the fact that our, our planet and all of the living things, including us that depend on it, that we get this right. Survival depends on us changing a few things about the way we live. And we need to use our brains to solve and work on those problems. And all of us have a part in this. The first time we force our brains to tackle something this big and this challenging can't be after it's too late. So many characteristics are wired into the hardware of the brain. The brain makes us social. The brain makes us value connections to the people we love. It compels us to share our knowledge and experience, our trials, failures, and successes so that others can learn from our experience. The brain helps us solve problems in creative ways. And schools are places where all of these things can happen. They're where new minds mix with experienced ones. They're where we can build and create and fail forward. We need the time and space to hear others' stories, but we also need the time and space to write our own. We benefit from having some of the answers in the back of the book, but we need the freedom to work out which questions matter enough to answer. Because in the end, we don't know where we go from here, and that's okay. 
our history has already been etched into the planet's surface. The legacy of recorded experience is here to help us move forward. By learning from each other, teaching each other, and connecting with one another, our brains and humanity's cumulative record of experience will together help us decide what our next steps should be. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.